all the lights on it, Dr. Joe Benitez. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you all for um, taking the time. Uh, this is some ongoing work that I have going with uh, uh, Liza Creel and uh, Jamie Jennings, uh, two of my colleagues in the Department of Health Management and System Science here at U of L. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, as I said, this is ongoing work, so while it's being considered for a peer, it's under peer review right now as we speak, but um, it's not done until it's published, so um, any type of advice you can give or concerns you may have, feel free to ask them as we go along. Um, so well, without further ado, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Batman. <laughs> not working. There's a little switch on the back of it. Yeah, it's better to put the keyboard closer to the receiver. Get a hammer. Oh, put it up here. Oh, okay. Right. Right here. Okay, we'll just go old fashioned. We'll just use a regular mouse. Um, okay. So, like I said, um, Okay, so as Paul mentioned, we are focusing on the the initial one year effects of Kentucky's Medicaid expansion. So Kentucky was one of the only two southern states to expand Medicaid. Uh, the other one being Arkansas, who is one of the um, Section 1115 waivers. Um, what Kentucky is doing is expanding the traditional Medicaid program, where they're um, increasing the eligibility up to 138 percent of federal poverty. So just to give you an outline of the talk this this early afternoon, um, give you some, uh, an introduction and some background research or some, some background information. I'll explain to you the research questions. Um, a little bit more background about how the policy implications of it um, and the significance. And I'll give a detailed information about the methodology, then the results, and then the conclusions. Okay, so as I mentioned before, Kentucky is one of the only two southern states, so what it means is um, by expanding Medicaid for Kentuckians, uh, they're allowing more people to potentially be enrolled in Medicaid, um, which would potentially address some of the issues we're concerned about, which are direct issues about access to care, uh, focusing on um, medical needs because of costs or out-of-pocket expenditures, and as well as some glimpse of utilization, so just the likelihood of actually having a regular source of care. So, um, as mentioned, there's 19 states that are not expanding Medicaid. Um, most of them are um, predominantly in the South, um, but um, there's a little geographic variance as well. Um, but what it actually means is not expanding Medicaid means that you're foregoing some federal dollars to actually support access to care, and um, which other healthcare institutions will actually benefit from. So expanding states, they're just by reducing their uninsured amounts through expansion, um, they're likely to, ex they're projected to experience a $2 billion increase in hospital revenues. So what that means is hospitals are able to do um, provide more services. They would also be, um, particularly if you're a safety net hospital, you treat a large um, share of people that are low income or historically uninsured. Um, that can mean that you're better able to continue operating as a safety net and for hospitals operating at very low or even negative margins, it could also mean survival. So just that they're able to stay in the healthcare delivery system. I'll just tell you, University Hospital, the traditional 25% Medicaid rate is down since her uninsured rate is fallen from 25 to um, less than 6%. For for Kentucky or for? For, for the University Hospital. Okay, great. I'll probably have to ask you more about that um, after this. <laughs> I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. That's exactly kind of. So that's just, not Kentucky one. It's just the university. Right now. And it's University Hospital. Okay. Great. Okay. 
So here's the essence of the research question that we're asking. So what was the effect of Kentucky's Medicaid expansion on the uninsurance rate among low income? So mainly it's the low income group, so which we're defining as people that with an annual household income of low twenty five thousand. I'll actually get to um, explain more about why we use that cutoff uh, further in the presentation. Um, but what we're trying to do is actually capture the uptake of insurance among the group who were likely to benefit from it. And um, moving on from that, we want to look at some potential effects on access to care. So as I mentioned before, I'm at medical needs because of costs and then having a regular source of care. So give you some background. Um, the Kentucky expansion is getting a lot of press in the news, both locally and nationally, as you can see, with reports coming in. The Kaiser Family Foundation, which is based in D.C., um, other reviews about it um, locally with Kentucky. Um, so expansion is a fairly contentious issue right now. So one of the implications is really understanding how much people are benefiting from it or if they're benefiting at all. So that's kind of the the approach that I'm taking. So just seeing what actually happened when Kentucky expanded Medicaid. So that's essentially what we're trying to figure out. So in the short term, um, as of August 2015, it was reported that 1 million new enrollees um, were covered under Medicaid as of August 2015. And uh, just to give you some background about how uh, the size potential size of part of the population. So about 600,000 people in Kentucky living on the poverty line, which is a poverty rate of about 15%, which is, um, ranks 39th in as far as states, states go. Okay, so the significance of our research. Um, we argue that they are timely, given the contentious nature of Medicaid expansion, and that there are still some states that could be um, could be determining if they're going to expand in the future. It will be useful to those states to, ex to see what's actually going on, so how residents are actually um, potentially benefiting from the expansion. So that's why we use uh, Kentucky as a focal point, point. And then we actually have a few states, neighboring non-expansion states, that we use as control to um, to inform what may happen should these states um, decide to expand later. And we also, um, I won't get into it in this, but what we believe is that it can actually inform some of the more long run um, effects of access to care, including um, some actual health effects. So if there's any lives saved or if there's um, effects on utilization or overall health status. So those are things that we think our work can actually inform the future. So I am to to answer the question using repeated cross sections from the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey. It uh, comes from the Centers for Disease Control um, freely downloadable survey. And what I'm actually going to do is use um, just under 46,000 weighted observations. Um, and then using the sampling weights from the survey and the methodology that CDC recommends on um, using those weights to account for the complex survey design to actually get some um, plus state um, estimates. Um, and the approach that I'm actually going to use, it's a uh, quasi-experimental difference in difference study design. And I'll explain more about the design as, um, right now. So. Um, Let's see. So what it's actually doing, the approach, it's actually exploring the timing of the expansion and then utilizing um, the neighboring non-expansion states, so Missouri, Tennessee, and Virginia, as plausible control states um, to essentially say what could have happened had these states elected to expand. Um, and as I mentioned before, using cross-sections with purpose. Can you clarify the uh, federal poverty level uh, a bit uh, in, in this context? Uh, 
I heard you say that you were, you were going to focus on individuals below the poverty line, right. but the Medicaid guidelines, you know, apply to you know families or, or households, right? You know, so I'm I'm a little okay, fuzzy sure. about you know definition. Okay, so one of the problems with the behavioral side of surveillance survey, it kind of has a um, it categorizes income. So they're, they tend to be in $5,000 um, increments. So um, if your annual household income is 10 to 15,000, 15,000 to uh, actually 25,000, 25 to 30, and, and so on. So that's kind of how we categorize. So there's not a precise way to um, really catch the people that are um, fully should be under the federal poverty just can't purpose it. So um, what I am able to do is um, look at their income and then their household size. So that kind of gets gets at that a little bit. Um, so that's where I'm getting. But I do have some um, sensitivity analyses that I will show to kind of um, show that it's actually capturing the population. Like, to kind of, right. Any other questions? All right, so what difference and difference is doing, it's one of the, any applied microeconomist will say is their, essentially is their uh, Swiss Army knife to a answering policy questions. Um, if there's a policy that was implemented at a particular time, then um, the goal is to use um, the treated place or treated unit. And in this case, unit of analysis is at the um, individual or household level. Um, and then we're exploiting some time variation, so which would be comparing trends pre and post the expansion, and then some variation across states. So which the saying the treatment state will be Kentucky, and then the control non-expanding states are Missouri, Tennessee, Virginia, um, since they're the neighboring non-expanding. Um, other states that neighboring states that have elected to expand Medicaid neighbors to Kentucky include Illinois. And Ohio, and as well as West Virginia. So what I'm focusing on is the um, relative change compared to the non-expansion states. Um, it would be interesting later to actually look compare Kentucky's Medicaid expansion against the other expanding states, but there's different components that make their expansion slightly um, different. So what we want to do is still compare apples to apples. So Kentucky versus the other states is what we're focusing. Um, to get at valid inference using this type of approach, it requires that there's a parallel path assumption, which, and which all that means is you have two units essentially that have similar trend lines. They just have to be par relatively parallel to each other. So in the absence of the policy, um, their trend lines would be still remain parallel or still have a similar slope trend. Um, so what I'm actually doing, I'm actually doing a different flavor on uh, this. So I'm actually adding more specification, which allows for more credible inference by including multiple time points. So what I'm actually using is quarters. So rather than just use the single year of 2014, because that's when the expansion happened, I'm breaking the year up into um, quarters. So first, second, third. So the main reason that it actually gives a pretty much a satisfactory falsification test, which basically says, okay, well, and including one year of dummy from 2013. So you shouldn't see any effect in 2013, and you should see all the action coming in 2014, and particularly later 2014. And also to relax the assumption that all of the uptake and coverage or effects on access were immediate or they were constant throughout the year. So that's what this um, flavor allows me to test. So I will say um, that, I'll say this among friends right now, um, economists tend to be lazy mathematicians. So what we're actually doing, all we're doing when we get to the approach before it, or that I mentioned earlier is we're comparing averages, so we're comparing um, changes in trends. 
And what I want to say is that just an expression of the policy parameter that we're interested in. So, so essentially going to be our causal parameter of interest. So we have this, this three simple um, coefficient row. Um, that's going to give us the average treatment effect on the treated or um, in other terms, how much the Kentuckians actually benefit from the expansion. So that's what we're trying to get. So if you think about it, we have four um, essential means or unconditional probabilities that we could use. Um, the probability that a person is uninsured um, and they're a Kentucky resident prior to the expansion, and then we can, uh, then there's probability of being uninsured post expansion, and then the same thing for uh, residents in the control states. So to get at the um, effect, what we're looking at. Some so you, you said one thing and what's written is another. The, uh, for A, you know, you said three. Or I I said zero. Huh? I said zero. Yeah, so this would be essentially, okay, so if you think about it as a dummy variable, um, post being zero um, will you indicate that you're in a pre-period, and then post equals one if you're in the period 24 and a half. Okay, so just some simple math will actually give us the um, the actual treatment effect that we're interested in capturing. And in case you don't necessarily want to look at letters, it's easier to follow words. Um, what we're actually subtracting is changes in un, uninsurance rates between um, the treatment and the control group. So we have the change among the treated population which would be the change in Kentucky's uninsured rate over over time. And compare that against, subtract from that the change in the um, control state's uninsured rate. And that's exactly what we're trying to get at. Um, hopefully I'm not putting you to sleep. Hopefully um, this is um, understandable. If, um, if you have any questions about this, um, please don't be afraid to ask. Was this, was this easier to do this at this rate? That's a body you know. No, oh, so okay. So what we're getting at is going to be a regression. Um, and I'm actually using a linear model because it's a lot easier to interpret directly from the coefficient. So it'll be a lot easier to say what happened to policymakers or non-statisticians um, if I say a 12 percent, uh, 12 percentage point change occurred as opposed to. Um, this coefficient on a logit or profile. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sure. So, to kind of show, here's what we're doing as far as regression and how it's actually specified. Um, just say the dependent variable is some measure of access. It might be uninsured, it might be um, the likelihood that you had an unmet medical need in the past year because of cost, or it might um, the likelihood that you not have a regular source of provider care. Um, so there's going to be an initial baseline coefficient, which is our beta naught. Um, the coefficient on beta one that captures the um, pre-expansion difference in um, Kentucky's say on the short. Um, then we have a series of dummies to indicate the um, order which we're observing you in. And then what we're actually, where we're going to get our action is in these series of, of five uh, interaction terms between Kentucky and fourth quarter 2013 and the first through fourth quarters of 2014. Um, what I'm also, so just to explain the variables a little bit more. Um, Kentucky equals one if you're a Kentucky resident, zero if you're otherwise. Um, and then here's the orders that I mentioned. The, what I'm also controlling for is individual level um, covariates, so age of the person, race, ethnicity, educational attainment, marital status, as well as the uh, political status. And I did not include, but I also control for the size of the household. Yes. The VR does and beta is it 
from 2014 or is it from the previous year? 2014. 2014, yes. okay, and it's including all the states that um, the surrounding states and Kentucky? I'm just, uh, so including Kentucky as well as the neighboring non states. So, Tennessee, uh, Virginia, Missouri, right. All right. Um, and then also, yes. Can I, now remember, I'm going to help. Okay, sure. Um, so, I'm going to dim it down just for my sake. Okay. Um, so, is, is this, are you predicting probability that someone is insured based on where they live, what time, what quarter they're in, and the other covariance, age, race, so Right, okay. So, as opposed to say, like, a predictive model this is actually what we're what we're kind of getting at is causal inference here so causal inference and in, in the observational setting so it's kind of the nature of quasi experiments or natural experiments which is kind of um the world i attempt to live in um so what we're actually capturing is using data from the behavioral respective surveillance surveys what was the effect of the expansion on on insurance or the likelihood that you were uninsured? Um, the likelihood you've had another medical need because of costs and the likelihood that you were without a regular source of care. Um, so I probably could have mentioned this say instead of just ASD, I could have mentioned it as P um, ASD. So then it becomes a problem. Um, does that does that help at all? Yeah, so okay. A-S-I-A-I-S-T. So, right. Okay, so where it's coming from is we're looking at individuals, so that's subscript I um, across states, so subscript S, and then we're also comparing across time. So, um, so that's kind of where there's, um, if you're the individual is a Kentucky resident, so they reside in Kentucky, um, then the quarters are subscript T. Um, individual level covariance, and then I have um, include state level dummies to say there's some generosity that's um, time invariant, so it's constant across time that would capture some of the differences in access that we might actually see. Any yes, you got okay, all right. So any other questions? And I think we're, I think we're okay on time. So all right, all right. So just to, if you decide you want to check out right now and um, leave and you probably got something better to do, here's a summary of the key findings. Um, the So what we actually observe, we see a 27-point reduction in the uninsured rate for low-income Kentucky. So that's a reduction of 71% um, in the time frame we're looking at. We also see a 41% uh, reduction. Percent reduction in the likelihood that the low income experience and unmet medical needs was cost, and then 37 percent reduction in the fraction that did not have a, a regular source of care. All right, so I guess I'll continue since nobody moved. So. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, so here's uh, show and tell time. So what we're actually trying to capture is what was the effect of the policy um, across time using um, states as control and treatment. So to give you an idea of what's going on. These are just the unadjusted um, probability or fraction without health insurance um, by year and then by quarter. So say in the initial quarter would be um, the first quarter uh, 2006, and the second quarter being uh, second quarter 2006 as well, and so on and so forth. So what we're actually doing, so at this period, 2013, this marks the last time before Kentucky elected to expand Medicaid. So what we're actually trying to find out is how much of this dip, which is um, the change in Kentucky's um, uninsured rate among the low income, how much of that is actually due to the policy. So in order to do that, we have some plausible controls. So here's the low income rate among uh, the control states going on at the same time. 
And then here is um, some trend lines across um, <coughs> groups that would likely not be affected by the decision to expand Medicaid. So what we're calling these two slope lines is there's the Kentucky high income group, which is represented by the small dotted line. Um, as you can see, and as expected, they have a relatively low uninsured rate. And then we see that same slope trend line for uh, the same group in Missouri, Tennessee, and Virginia. We probably get, can see it a little bit more clearly, even though I guess at a fairly messy way when we break it down by quarters. Because say we just rely on the year observation. It's assuming that the uptake was probably just occurring constantly across the year and that there was no difference in the timing of the year. Um, so what looking at the, the quarter um, fractions actually allows us to determine if there was a woodwork effect. So woodwork effects means, okay, people that are newly eligible or previously would have gotten insurance, they're coming out of the woodwork to actually um, get their new coverage. Um, actually, what we don't, we don't see that. We actually see more of a kind of a trickling in with the largest effects of the fourth quarter. Um, and then that's comparing against the slopes in the other states. So this is the, the main effects for uninsurance. And then we see the similar findings for financial barriers, which is unknown medical needs and cost. Um, some problems here with the year observ yearly observations. Um, but the way the question is asked in the behavior risk factor surveillance survey is if you had an unmet medical need the past year due to cost. So if people are being asked this in the first quarter, you know, they could be going back to the first quarter of the previous year. So what we're seeing is that we, and as expected, we're seeing the largest effects in the final quarter of 2014. Um, and then really no, not much action in the high income group at all. So we don't see a whole lot of action. Um, it's it's a little different when you start to look at the regression estimates, um, but we don't see a whole lot of action in the uptake of regular uh, of a regular provider. Um, but we see it a little bit more clearly, um, just focusing on the solid um, the solid line with um, circles. Um, that's indicating the Kentucky Bone Boom group, which is the main group that should be um, benefiting from the policy. So that's where we start to see the dip in the slope, whereas if there was no binding effect of the policy, the line would follow the same or similar trend um, without slowing down as much. All right. Any questions? It just seems to me that it wouldn't make sense theoretically that getting a rate of service and care, there'd be a time lapse right on mm -hmm. the uptake. Sure. Right, and you're exactly right. And that's kind of why I still. So, granted, it wouldn't be instantaneous. Yeah, like, like going forward, like post, year. like in 2015, 2016. Exactly. And limited to what the data can show us. Um, so, the most recent version of the Harris Extractive Surveillance Survey is 2014. That's out right now. Um, it didn't come out until uh, mid September of uh, 2015. So, that was when all this work happened. So between um, so right after September, yes. Jeff, um, since this is um, really an important issue now, the RFS doesn't routinely ask the questions of the year. Right. They do sort of, you know, alternate timings and so forth, but are they planning? Yeah. If they're, so as far as I can, yeah, so as far as I can remember, the this, um, granted the uninsurance questions changed for the most part. Um, it's been relatively stable, so it keeps the same kind of information. So I'm not able to, well, I guess one of the problems is that I don't know what type of insurance coverage that these people have. I only know that they have insurance of some kind. Um, so that's the importance of actually um, just looking at the timing of policy. So it just asks if you have insurance. I think the National Health Interview Survey does ask if it's Medicare or Medicaid. Um, but the BRFSS does not. Um, the questions, so the access to care questions, it's asked the questions for 
at least since the mid '90s. I want to say um, every single year. Every single year, there was 2000. Um, 2001, they changed the question some, but they immediately changed back. But in the period that I'm answering, 2006 and 2014, the questions were stable at the time. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, are the questions clear enough to respond? Sometimes they get what insurance provoke insurance claim. Right, so the question asks if you have insurance of any kind. So then there's some people that don't know. Um, there's some people that um, are unsure. And then some people that just don't respond to the question. Um, the validity of the question is not necessarily, I don't think it's necessarily an issue because the people that are unsure about their coverage, it's, um, Probably less than a quarter of a percent in any given year of the survey, um, from what I can remember. Um, I don't believe it would affect um, my um, estimates. The main thing that would say if it was a different question and they asked, okay, which there is some measurement error um, in, say, the type of insurance you have. Some people um, would say that they're covered under private insurance, but they might be under. A Medicaid managed care program. Um, so that's kind of where some of the um, some of the error may come from. But for the most part, if you, most people tend to know if they have coverage. Yeah. And there there is a small percentage of people who really truly are not sure if they have insurance because they're in the process of application through Medicaid right. and haven't been approved yet. So or haven't gotten to take that. They they really don't know. Um, but also. Um, the survey through 2014 and the, the timing of all of it in relationship to then tax returns in 2015. I think by tax returns in 2015, everybody knew whether they had insurance or not, right? Because then they get um, So we'll figure that out next year. It's a better question. <laughs> Just to give you some of the baselines about these states. So just looking at 2006 to 2013, um, what's the, how do the states actually compare to each other? Just um, say this, treat this as the uninsured rate. So about, um, and this is just uh, the full sample. So not uh, the low income group. This is a full sample of uh, persons that I'm actually looking at. So um, nothing glaring. You know, there's lower uninsured rate in Virginia. Um, Slightly lower, you know, people that have had unmet medical needs in Virginia as well, but for the most part, there's nothing over declaring, particularly as you get to if you had a, did not have a regular provider. Um, what is important is that the, there are some slight differences here um, in just the fraction of the household incomes with um, income below 25000 and then below 15000 um, these are actually going to inform some of the sensitivity analysis that I'll um, show as we go further. So, yeah. Yeah. Excuse me? The still uninsured? Yes. That I can't remember offhand. Um, for the most part, it's still, it's gone down some, mainly due from the um, health insurance exchanges. Um, but as far as any effect that's due to expanding Medicaid, um, not much of an effect. And I'll probably, some of the results I have will probably help to show that. So, now, going back to focusing on the low income um, population. So, no surprise there. The baseline uninsured rate, um, 2006 to through third quarter 2013. Fairly comparable, nothing surprising. Um, we see that there's 36, 37% uninsured rate among low income for the control states as well as the Kentucky. 
Now what we're actually doing is we're comparing trends. So treat all of these. These are, granted these are regression coefficients from the models <coughs> that I provide. Um, what they're actually showing is the trend in the uninsured rate. So how much it decreased over the same lots of time. So um, at what we're expecting in fourth quarter 13 is that there's non-significant, relatively non-negative effects on insurance. So nothing glaring there. Um, but we do see that there's some slight increase in um, on insurance. So it could be people that are getting off of plans in Kentucky in favor of getting ready for the Medicaid expansion. So it might have some substitution for them. Um, but what we really start to see is the action through 2014, which is what we really want to see. So this is where we get, so at the end of uh, first quarter 2014, the actual reduction in in Kentucky due to the expansion was about 11.5 uh, percentage point change um, by for the second quarter relative to this um, 37 percent, 10 and a half, um, 11 and a half percent to third quarter, and the largest um, by the fourth quarter. You can see the Kentucky trend as well as the actual effect on the policy. And remember, in order to get the the causal estimator, what we're doing is we're subtracting, say, this negative 3.2 um, from this negative 29. And that's how we actually get these, um, these different percentage change. This is actually giving us our causal estimator of interest. And just for simplicity, um, the stars are representing the significance of um, three stars means it's below 0.01, two stars below 0.05, and then one single star means it's okay, marginal, it's below 0.10. So this was the effect on uninsurance. This is the effect on likelihood of experiencing an element of the need because of cost. So by the fourth period, which was where we expect to see the largest binding effect, be about a 17 percentage point back. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And then what we see is similar. This is where using the quarters really comes into play because if you just use the year, most of it's being weighed down by um, these, year, these quarters where nothing's really happening. But as expected, we see the largest effect. So we're seeing an increase in the amount of people. Uh, with a regular source of care, mainly during the latter part of 2014. So they don't really add. They're essentially they're essentially the previous table I said, just in um, the standard regression table format um, with the standard errors below. But um, if you if you buy these, then then really these are just to supplement. So any questions so far, or any other questions? Well, probably a little bit a lot faster than I thought. Um, so I guess we'll just go ahead and we can wrap up with conclusions. Um, so we mainly find largely positive um, effects on coverage as well as um, the two measures of access that we decided to look at. Um, and we find we. We are able to show at least some early evidence that the low income population, which would be um, people most likely to fall into the poverty pool or would have historically fallen into coverage gap of uh, Medicaid, to be benefiting from uh, the expansion. And this is comparing against the trends in uh, states that want to not expand Medicaid. Um, what we also think is that some of these results might actually be formative to other states that are also early in their expansions or are determining whether they elect to expand uh, Medicaid in the next coming years. <clears throat> so we didn't mention I didn't mention any of these in the paper, but we do have some ideas for extension that we're planning to get. So um, now that we show that there's some positive effects on 
on these measures of access, particularly insurance coverage, um, is there any effect on disparity? So actually closing the, say, the gap, the coverage gap between the low income and the high income, which we kind of get at in some of the slides, if you can remember those from earlier. Um, does it affect the utilization rates? So particularly um, utilization of preventive services or screening for breast cancer or vaccination. Um, health status, do people, are people more likely to report that they're healthier or in good to excellent health status if we were to use the same type of survey data? Uh, I, I would add under utilization rates, you know, uh, emergency uh, room, you know, utilization, sure. uh, perhaps in comparison to primary care. The word on the street that I've heard locally is that uh, the increase in primary care may be there, but it, it's not as much as expected. And um, I think there, you know, ha have been reports. I have not seen any substantiating data, you know, that emergency room use is up. Sure. Okay. Let's go. And, and that your next point that you're going to go to about uh, comparisons to expansions in other states is, you know, politically relevant, you know, given Bevan's comments that he wants to model after Indiana. That lead to medical exchange just taking the exchange to Dr. Steiner? I don't um, It can't because the medical exchange doesn't include Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. So it would simply be that people would have to go to the medical exchange for a health insurance plan, but they would no longer get subsidies or qualified or Medicaid if they're. Under 38% So there are still uh, implications in the Democratic House of Labor. And then, uh, that is the exchange. It's debatable. It's debatable and unknown, quite honestly, because of, um, it's gonna re it, it just depends on a lot of variables, like the CMS's response and their support that they put into um, Women Connect as an exchange. So, so far when they've dismantled other state exchanges, it's been exchanges that don't work. It's never been done that they would dismantle a CMS of a server that seems like a, a workable exchange. And we do have a model exchange that works on day one. And from a systemic standpoint, the technology system. And, um, but what Bevin did was an executive authority to put Medicaid expansion in place. I mean, yeah, sorry, this year. Did, and so, executive authorities and executive, um, they're in place outside of legislative sessions. So, because when that takes office next month, he'll be outside of a legislative session, so it's a possibility that he can do that executive authority. Um, but he also has to give a year's notice that connects to this handle. So, the earliest possible undoing. A connect would be January 1st of 2017 if it goes smoothly really quickly. But what Bevan hasn't really done a good job of that I know of yet because he's not in office and really has access to all the paperwork is that he doesn't understand, I don't think he knows the actual cost of this thing to him from an economic standpoint, right? So he thinks that long term we, that it would save us money, but in the moment it will cost us a significant to undo the money. So the answer to that question is <laughs> we don't know, and okay, we're holding our breath, waiting. Well, to see what so, any okay, and that's actually the end. Um, any other questions? I'm obviously around um, down the hall um, for um, everyone in the room. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, thank you so much for the discussion. I really appreciate it. Oh, yes. So, Mikey, um, you'll be able to look at the geographic. So, right, okay, um, yeah. So, well, it's something that you're interested in. Right, yeah. So, I'm still interested in. So, I guess one question is so, expansion happened in Kentucky, but 
there's no reason to believe that it's constant across the state. So knowing where the expansion was the greatest or um, places that, granted, they have the eligible population to benefit from the expand, um, where it was essentially slow to expand or didn't have the expansion. So kind of understanding what those are. Those uh, contextual variables might be that actually. I think you remember some some maps, you know, uh, that showed that the eastern mountain states, you know, most responsive. That does not. Okay. Well, is there so is that constant? So if you just look within Kentucky and say at a county level or at a, oh, a health level, you know, looking at the Medicaid. Right. Uh, or right. And we're, we're, the plan is to use the, um, so the state specific, um, behavioral sector surveillance array uh -huh. that actually has, um, county identifiers for all yeah, the, that's a lot for of all, exactly. Right, yeah. Um, there are some zip codes for some of the patients. Um, so that would actually be helpful in matching those patients to say, um, uh, primary care service area. Or help for a region. So some of the other uh, geographic geographies of interest that tend to use about the dark um, and some other health service search settings. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. So Jones, very early on, but do you know of any data that look at uh, death rates in states involved, Kentucky versus others? Is there any early trends? Change or in hospitalization. Oh, could um use um say um discharge so hospital discharge data. Um at least if it's clean it has a say their status so if they were alive or dead, you know, upon being released from the hospital. So it act, that would actually be um it would be a matter of getting the data from the other states as well. Uh but I do have I do have that for Kentucky, um so the inpatient and the outpatient files. Um, and then there's some states that participate in um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and call it the Healthcare Utilization Project, which they do submit their inpatient and outpatient data to on a fair basis. So, so that's definitely feasible. I have a quick question. Was race or ethnicity a significant response? Oh, wait. So, you were just talking about it. Oh, so I use that, so I use that as, a, as a control. Um, Kind of what I found was, and not anything included in this paper, but just kind of looking at so the media effect on. So say if I just stratify it across uh, racial, um, don't really find much of anything different. The slope is about the same, so the effect is the same. Um, I can't remember if it was um, a larger effect, but the. Goal is not necessarily say to, I guess some of what, as opposed to like say explaining all the variation, um, but like which becomes an R squared question or, or a pseudo R squared. Um, what we're trying to capture is the the effect of the policy, which is really looking at the causal nature and that the coefficient is actually um, doing what we expect it to. Um, so on some other work, I've included the model both with and without controls, and the coefficients didn't change at all. The standard errors were um, a little tighter, but otherwise, um, no major effects that would affect the efforts at all. Any other questions? All right, then. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah, I was putting it. Oh, no, it's no problem at all. Yeah, I guess we're I got your email. Okay.